A filer, the third. I don't normally use the third. But I was in the U.S. Air Force, and uh, my final rank was major. I don't know what else you'd like to know. Well, Have an MBA, <laughs> and uh, as a former vice president of MedCorps. In other words, I've done other things since leaving the Air Force. I was a navigator in various aircraft, a tanker and transport aircraft, uh, flew last in C-141s at McGuire Air Force Base. I was also an intelligence officer most of my career as my uh, desk job, so to speak. And I, in that period, frequently, you know, briefed generals and congressmen on uh, our capabilities and the threat to our forces. Well, I was uh, normally, like I mentioned, a briefing officer, and I would come to work four o'clock or so in the morning, and on the uh, morning of January 18th, 1978, I drove through the main gate at McGuire, and uh, <clears throat> I noticed uh, that there was red lights out on the runway, um, and that uh, probably something was going on out, out on the runways there because of all the red lights. and. Uh, you know, like police cars and fire trucks and so on. And didn't think too much about it until I got to 21st Air Force Command Post is where I worked. And I would go in there and prepare a briefing for what the was your position there? generals. I was a, a deputy director of intelligence for 21st Air Force, which controlled, well, half the... Uh, military aircraft and flew the presidents and uh, various VIPs and uh, from the Mississippi River around to India. We had uh, some 300 aircraft and uh, we were flying all kinds of missions, uh, submarine crews, almost anything that had to do with the military airlift we accomplished. And this particular morning when I went into the command post, I was met by the head of the command post and he said that it's been a very exciting evening that we've had UFOs in the, you know, over the McGuire all night and that one had uh, apparently landed or possibly crashed at uh, Fort Dix and that when a uh, mil military policeman came upon the uh, alien that he had pulled out a gun and shot them. And I said, you know, uh, a foreigner? Like, you know, an alien? I was a little bit confused by him saying alien. And he says, no, an alien from outer space. He was very specific about the fact that an alien from outer space had been shot at Fort Dix and that it had uh, run away after being wounded and headed for McGuire. Now, McGuire and Fort Dix just have a fence between them. And uh, this alien supposedly climbed the fence or went under it or whatever and got to McGuire and died out on the end of the runway. And uh, the security police were out there and had uh, captured the body, so to speak, and uh, were guarding it. And he said that a C-141 from Wright-Patterson was coming in to pick up the plane. Now that made me stand up because I didn't realize that Wright Patterson had C-141s. I thought Military Airlift Command was the only one who owned uh, C-141 aircraft. So I was like, you know, my gosh, what's going on here? And he says, we want you to brief this at the, you know, stand up general briefing this morning and uh, explain what happened to everybody. And I was like, you want me to tell General Tom Sadler and everybody in the command post that, you know, we captured an alien? And uh, they said, yes, we want you to believe, uh, brief that this morning. Well, I did some checking around and I called the uh, 38th Military Airlift Wing command post to check with them to see if 
in other words, the story was the same that I was getting. And they said, yes, that, that they had heard that also, that this actually did happen, that uh, an alien was found on the base. And uh, later that morning, I was told that uh, they decided not to brief it in the stand-up briefing. Uh, and so I didn't, I didn't actually brief it. Now, the only other thing that was interesting is that uh, that morning I carried what's code word down to the General Sadler's office, and I noticed some commotion going on in there, and that uh, some of the security police people were there in rather disheveled and so on, and that uh, General Sadler was a stickler for everybody looking perfect, and it was kind of surprising to see these people that obviously needed shaves and were in fatigues and so on there. So then I knew that some that that might tie into the story that I had heard. Now after the briefing, I also went to the photo lab. Almost every day I went to the photo lab because in your briefings you have uh, well four screens and you have to keep them all, you know, filled up with pretty pictures and so on. <laughs> and uh, there they indicated that they had taken pictures of something extraordinary. And I said, well, let me see them. And the sergeant was handing it to me, and his master sergeant says, he, he can't see those. So all I know is that there, they had some pictures that I wasn't allowed to see. But normally, being the general's briefer, I had never been you know, stopped from seeing any pictures that they had previously. There is nuclear assets on, on the base that they <coughs> used to carry uh, weapons back and forth to Europe and so on. One, uh, I had done some checking around because I became interested. Um, I talked to one of the security policemen who claims to have been out there. And uh, he indicated that he essentially saw a, a small body that, you know, could have, been a, could have been like a child, but it seemed to have a larger than normal head. Now, one interesting thing is many of the key personnel on the base at that time who had a connection to this with this were quickly transferred from the wing commander on down, indicating that uh, if uh, you know you knew something you want they tended to split you up so to speak so you couldn't talk about it oh within a matter of weeks or whatever now the security policeman told me that he was transferred within a few days Matter of fact, he was taken to Wright-Patterson uh, within the day or two and debriefed by a number of people and essentially told not to talk about it anymore. Now, his, his story to me was that, you know, they heard this going on on the radios and they uh, heard that this chase was on, that the alien had been shot at Fort Dix and was they were chasing it towards McGuire, at least it, for whatever reason it, it was it chose to run towards McGuire Air Force Base. And that uh, both the uh, state police and the uh, military police were, you might say, chasing this person or alien, whoever it was. Uh, they came from what looked like a, <coughs> a UFO. As I understand, it was a disc-shaped crap. They indicated to me that the UFOs had been in the area for quite some time that evening, and that they had them on radar, and that the tower operator had seen them, and uh, some of the other aircraft uh, in the area had apparently seen them as well. Six or eight people guarding the body, and then there was the commander of the, of the um, security police unit, unit, and then we were told, a few of us in the command post, and um, I assume that General Sadler was briefed about it. Well, I happened to meet a lady who uh, claimed to have been out of White Sands, and uh, it was a an engineer working out there, and she was out hiking one day, and she told me that her and a couple of her friends had um, come up to the top of a hill and they could look down in this valley, but only their heads were showing, you know, on the top of the hill. They just happened to be looking over and down the way the 
path was. And they had seen a UFO on the ground with a couple of little aliens kind of like picking up rocks and stuff. And they watched it for an extensive period. It was, uh, you know, several hundred yards away from them. And they got a pretty good look at it. And, and eventually they did, the uh, aliens did see them. And uh, the craft, they jumped in the craft and took off. But I had personally never seen anything until about 1962. We were flying tankers over England, and London Control asked us to intercept a UFO. And uh, we happened to be done with our refueling mission. And, uh, you know, we accepted the assignment. We, we were on the, just over the North Sea, and they asked us to uh, fly to the center of England. And we were doing, I don't know, some 400 miles an hour in a dive down to intercept this object. And they uh, gave us headings, you know. And it was pretty much hovering in the rough Stonehenge area, uh, Oxford Stonehenge area. And uh, we got about, I'm not exactly sure, 20, 30 miles out, and I got it on radar. And it was a very large return. Um, we used to fly up by the fourth the Firth of Fourth Bridge, which is kind of like the San Francisco Bay Bridge, but it's a very large bridge. And uh, the return was similar to that in size and in intensity. In other words, it was a very large radar return. And obviously, London Control had it on their radar, and they were vectoring us to this object. And uh, when we got about a mile from it, as a matter of fact, we were diving on the thing and the whole aircraft was shaking <laughs> and uh, it, it just took off into space at several thousand miles an hour almost directly up and uh, now this was at night it reminded me a lot of the uh, shuttle launch you know something going up very quickly at a high rate of speed and uh, frankly at least to my knowledge we had nothing like that nothing like that capability Matter of fact, we said something about, uh, you know, how many kind of rocket launches from that area, and they said, no, that uh, we could just go <laughs> continue on our mission. So based on this lady's testimony and pretty much what we saw, uh, I believe that there was something, you know, going on out there. My best guess is that it was a disc-type craft, but a fat disc. At least there was lights, you know, something like this at the top and at the at the bottom. It was more than just uh, a s straight plate-like object. It had a, a dome on, a top, on the top of it. If the, if the radar return was accurate, uh, it was probably, uh, you know, just guessing, uh, 500 yards long or something. I mean, a huge, huge thing. It, Something that bothered me a little bit that they were very friendly as we're doing the intercept on the thing, and uh, once once the intercept was made and it had essentially we chased it away, they didn't want to talk about it any further. We wrote it in the, uh, the, the navigator's log, fairly detailed. Yeah, this is Briarwood Lake in Medford, New Jersey, and. Uh, we had just moved into this house, in any case, uh, we were asleep about, I'm just guessing, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm asleep with my wife, and uh, suddenly the room got very bright in the middle of the night. So I uh, got up out of bed and opened up the shade, but most of the light was com even coming through the shade, and uh, looked outside, and I don't know if most people have seen a submarine surfacing with all the water coming off. Well, this was like uh, a disk about 30 feet in diameter surfacing. And uh, what looked to me like water coming off of it. But uh, frequently I had flown the Atlantic and Pacific and so on and seen the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights and around the craft where this ionization very similar to the aurora borealis and it just kind of 
moved across the uh, the lake for a while and flew off at a fairly high rate of speed. Now, because of that, I've checked with a lot of the neighbors, and there's, I don't know the exact numbers, but there's like 40 or 50 lakes in Medford and Medford Lakes, and uh, I frequently brought up the subject if they had seen anything. And uh, it's amazing how many people have actually seen craft on the lakes. Well, occasionally I used to brief on the UFO sightings that uh, had been uh, occurred around the world to the generals. One that sticks out in my mind is 1976. There was a famous sighting in Tehran, Iran, where an F-4 or a couple F-4s chased a UFO. That kind of uh, sighting I would brief on occasion to the generals and they would be, you know, more or less interested. Then it, then someone would stop by and say, well, you know, I had my sighting. Uh, we were flying 106s over Colorado or whatever and uh, we dove on the UFO sitting there. Very similar to my story, except I was in a four-engine tanker and they were in a, uh, you know, two fighters and they would dive on the thing. At that time, uh, this particular colonel was telling me that the F-106 had set the world's record for speed. And they had these aircraft uh, going as fast as they could, so to speak, diving on this UFO that was hovering uh, in a valley in Colorado. And just like us, when they got near the craft, it took off and left them standing still, and they were doing like 1,500 or something, whatever the top speed was at that time for these aircraft in a dive. That these who, you know, is flying these have this capability that is far b beyond anything we've had for years and years, I think even today. Something, at least in my opinion, non-human. Um, that has a different form of propulsion and is uh, coming here and, uh, you know, rec doing reconnaissance and uh, taking minerals or whatever it is that they happen to be doing. There are things going on and uh, they are being seen, you know. Talk to a number of astronauts who have seen them, talk to other military pilots and the like who have seen them. and. Uh, uh, I remember uh, Captain Ramage, <coughs> who I used to work for in uh, Athens, Greece, and he had one during the Korean War fly right off his uh, wing, stay with him for like an hour, and do not only off his wing, but do, you know, acrobatic things around his aircraft. And I don't know the exact percentage of people, but probably 10% uh, of the pilots and air crews that you ask about it have had uh, sightings. A few years ago, um, a colonel who was, an intellig was in intelligence had his whole B-52 crew see it. And uh, now, you know, these people don't, uh, you might say, volunteer and sit in front of the camera and tell about it, but uh, there's an awful lot of people who have seen them. They're not sure exactly what they are and what they're doing, but they know that they have a advanced capability, and they usually see some kind of a, um, you know, solid object that appears to be made of some kind of metal, usually a gunmetal gray. Usually with, uh, particularly at night, people usually report uh, various lights around them. It seems to me I was told that it was, uh, put in some kind of a, you know, casket type thing and uh, and, and t taken away, so to speak, fl flown away. I think that in 1947 or in that time frame, something crashed out in, out west. You know, whether it was Roswell, the specific Roswell that's been written about, uh, but I think something happened out there, at least based on, you know, the, you might say the talk in the military that 
some, something crashed sometime out there. The tendency is to make things classified when you don't know what's happening. You know, secret, top secret, or whatever. And if it comes down from the president, it's a very high classification, probably code word above top secret. In other words, need to know that kind of thing. And once that caveat or designation is put on something, it's very difficult to get it downgraded. I mean, you can go to the archives and despite what they tell you, they have things uh, going back to the Second World War that you still are not allowed to look at. And uh, once these things are top secret or whatever, it's difficult to get it down. That, that, that it just kind of moves on and forever t stays top secret or whatever. They just keep it very classified and very secret, basing it on, uh, you can base it on the fact, for example, that uh, let's say this craft had advanced technological capabilities. So you don't want the uh, other side, so to speak, to know what you know and uh, how these things work and the like. It's to your advantage to keep this secret. I think that it's time that these various programs come out. Now one of the things that I've found is that the way it's been kept secret to a big uh, extent is the fact of through ridicule. If it always had been just top secret, I think most of the world would know about it today. But they put in a kind of a ridicule factor which made people You'll, you'll hear somebody telling a story like this, they'll say, well, he must be crazy that he believes in UFOs. But they, and they brought this out when anyone saw anything. You know, there'd be two people will say one has uh, funny hair and uh, looks wild and so on, and the guy standing next to him is a police officer. Well, they always interviewed the wild guy and never put the police officer on the screen. My experience has been... Uh, an awful lot of policemen have seen these, an awful lot of FBI have seen these, an awful lot of military has seen it, and he, he might be have the, like, at times I used to carry nuclear weapons. And in other words, I was uh, mentally fit to carry nuclear weapons, but I'm not mentally fit if I see a UFO. Well, this criticism and this ridicule is, I think, done more to keep the story coming out than almost anything else.